1 crore you cannot appear before a particular forum about 50 lakhs you cannot appear before a particular forum and hence there may be a case where if you win the litigation at a particular level your case may be strong your facts may be strong certain cash which is stuck up in litigation can therefore be released an immediate effect of releasing of those lit cash litigation would be release of certain provisions as far as books of concern as far as books of accounts are concerned and therefore increasing my profitability next point extremely pending extremely critical would be pursuing uh, uh, rectifications under 154 how many times we have seen how many times we have seen that certain demand which is raised is on account of mismatch in one great software which is the reconciliation of form 26 as one may have to perhaps sit with the revenue officers and therefore ensure that the if at all there are any reconciliation problems proper effect has been given to and, 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 and this may in turn lead to re either reduction in demand or maybe increase in refund claim. Next would also be a lower withholding obligation. This can be extremely critical for service industry. Friends, Finance Act 2020 made one amendment. It gave, it proposed to give a lot of things, but at the same time, there were certain riders attached. 194J was amended, so to say that there was a lot of litigation as to whether a particular payment is subject to withholding under 2%, whether a particular payment is subject to withholding under 10% regime. So they said that as far as technical services are concerned, or as far as certain things which we popularly call to be an FTS kind of services, the tax can be deducted at 2% concern. However, a rider was attached that if such services are professional in nature, then the applicable rate would be 10%. When we go and scan through the list of professional service, technical services are again included and hence the achieved end may not be achieved, hence the achieved purpose may not be achieved and still there may be a case where one will suffer a 10% withholding. For service industries where there is an overburden in terms of a fixed cost, employees cost and probable decrease in business as we go forward, there may be a case to apply for lower withholding certificate, unlock cash which would, which would have been blocked within the system and try to bring that cash within the business and therefore support this business. Next would be extremely critical to evaluate whether there are opportunities within my business to save tax, whether there are opportunities where I've got certain loss making company within the structure to merge it within myself to reduce the tax liability as also reduce certain duplicated cost and bring synergies on board. With this, there is another thing which is equally important is to test the reasonableness of certain claims. It is possible that in times where things was good, there may be a case of 50-50 and a business would have taken a call that let us pursue those litigation adverse, let, let us pursue those litigation vigorous. If such is the case, one will have to revisit those claims because go forward, if there is any strain in my business and certain disallowances are made, certain tax liability is raised, coupled with the interest cost of 12%, leaving apart penalty, etc., it may give rise to a significant issue. This is just to set certain themes. This is just to set certain contours. From here, we will try to look certain peculiar fact pattern. As I, state, as I stated, these are my uh, uh, imagination. Before I move forward, I also thank uh, Soumya Sheikh uh, for assisting because some of the case studies had to be extensively debated before we move forward. What government did was something like this, and this was a right move, something which facilitated corporating to partner with government, and therefore the scope of CSR activity, scope of CSR activity was therefore stated that whatever expenditure you incurred, maybe for the purpose of COVID assisting COVID uh, situation, it can be spending to for the poor, it can be rehabilitation of migrant worker, it can be contributions to PM cares fund, so on and so forth. We will consider this to be CSR expenditure. And therefore a pot potential opportunity or a potential uh, option was given to the corporating that in any case you have to spend 2% of your particular net profit, support us in this pandemic time and hence we will count this as CSR expenditure. We don't want anything more and this can perhaps be a good option. Now friends, this brings us to a very interesting situation. CSR as far as India is concerned and, and charity and donations are in, in, imbibed into the culture of our country. 
it is possible that people who may be earning crores of rupees may be mandated may be mandated by spending in csr but it is equally possible that a person who may not be earning that much big as corporating may be having a resilient earning line but still he would like to contribute to charity and therefore a question arises here that expenditures which are incurred for covid 19 how will i look a business deductibility when i pass it through the ring fencing of explanation 2 to section 37 what does this explanation say? And before I move further, if Akshita is there, can you just confirm that my A voice is audible? B screens are moving. Yes, Bhamik, uh, the right. presentation is visible and uh, you right. are very clearly fair. on it. All right, fair. We move forward from here. Therefore, there is explanation two to section 37. There may be certain situations which may arise. There may be certain situations which may arise. What does explanation 2 say to me? Explanation 2 says that for the removal of doubt, no deduction would be given under section 37 in respect of expenditure incurred for the purposes that is incurred for the purpose of social, for the purpose of corporate social responsibility, which are referred to in section 135. Followed an announcement for MCA that whatever COVID-19 expenditure you are incurring would be eligible. That is Schedule 7, the list of Schedule 7 which mandates or which mentions the list of expenditure which would be eligible for CSR was therefore expanded. Certain FAQs was, in, was, was, was thereafter stated and I believe there would be further FAQs which may come. They stated that if you are contributing to a particular PM care fund, that would be entitled or that would be considered at par with CSR pending. However, for reason best known to government, if you are contributing to certain CM fund of state, that would not be considered CSR expenditure. And therefore, within this particular provision itself, there are certain dilemmas which are there. As I stated, it is not that all taxpayers may be forming part of CSR. There may be businesses who may not cross the threshold of Section 135, whatever corporate law provides, certain turnover, certain net worth, certain uh, net profitability. I may be a corporate who may not be particularly falling within those limits. It is equally possible that I may be an LLP doing business on my own. I may be a proprietor doing business on my own. And I am going here and helping and partnering with government in order to mitigate certain COVID-19 repercussions. To them, the question will arise is, for expenditures which was incurred for the purpose of COVID-19, whether can I say that those expenditures are deductible under Section 37.1? A second question which will also arise therefore is that this is, the, as I stated, that CSR is pending. CSR means donation and more importantly, CSR comes with it responsibility. Entire framework has been given under provisions of Companies Act that you need to have a CSR committee. That CSR committee will lay down certain CSR plan. That CSR plan has to be approved by board of director. That has to be made public in terms of your annual report. That has to be made public in terms of whatever is there on your website. And therefore, there would be an entire CSR planning which will take place. It is possible that some corporates would have taken CSR cause with a greater vigor. And therefore, there would be a CSR plan expenditure plan layout which would have been there. It can be a school for orphans. It can be a it can be a home a home for poor people. It can be certain plans, and therefore it can also be certain hospitals, certain schools, so on and so forth. So there would be a certain CSR plan which a corporate would have planned. Now it is not as if that a COVID nineteen calamity has struck that I will keep all my CSR plans at bay and leave those activity high and dry. It, we have time and again seen the uh, uh, the. the we have again time and again see the philanthropic heart of corporate world where in spite of incurring further expenditure on CSR, they would have opened or they would have loosened their purse to further incur, that is move further than CSR spending for the purpose of COVID-19. To them, the question will arise is that today when you are spending on CSR with advent of social media, advent of vigilant media, and more importantly, advance of citizen who today are willing who today are willing to grace those people who are spending and partnering with government sitting at home i have seen number of uh, tv channels where corporate csr spending that is how they are partnering with covid 19 expenditures have been given a greater uh, have been given an entire 30 minutes of show and therefore there is a lot of visibility which a corporate is getting there is a lot of goodwill which is getting built within the heart of people and hence the question is whether such expenditure but for such explanation 37 amounts to an expenditure which can be tax deductible 
provision status provision say just a second i'm just moving certain screens so that i yeah yeah provision say something like this that 371 a business deduction would be allowed if it is for the purpose of business courts in cases pre amendment pre explanation 2 to 37 have blessed have blessed corporates by giving deduction saying that in today's world taking care of social obligation a positive impact on goodwill perhaps if i would have perhaps if i would have spent it maybe 5 crores for the purpose of corp c covid expenditure but i would have been i would have been given a space in media which if i would have to sponsor would have been multiple times so this nothing but this is nothing but it helps in the corporate philosophy tomorrow if i am buying a particular product and i have an option maybe my heart will go with a person who supported me maybe if i am buying a limited parleji biscuit my heart be, will be with a company who helped me who helped me in sponsoring a particular meal when i was in one of the quarantine center and therefore the question would be whether this particular expenditure is allowable as business expenditure but for explanation 32 court was kind enough and there are judicial precedents depending upon the facts what was the facts that that was a case that assessi was able to prove the business link linkage assessi was able to prove the nexus as to how does it helps in improvising my goodwill and court has largely given a deduction in favor of it Gujarat High Court in, Namra, in Gujarat uh, uh, Narmada uh, uh, taken a view that there are two kind of CSR expenditure. One is voluntary in nature, which is where nothing applies. Section 135 does not apply to me. As far as those expenditure is concerned, still you have a window of Section 371 open. And therefore, for those corporates, therefore, for those corporates to whom Section 135 does not apply, or for LLPs, or for people who are doing proprietary business, if I am able to demonstrate, where there is a linkage between my business and the CSR activities which I am doing. I may be supplying certain food products. If it can visibly be demonstrated that the people who volunteers was wearing shirts of my company, there are positive photographs which has made viral in, uh, in social media. There have been media interviews where my work has been appreciated. It definitely adds to the goodwill purpose and therefore there is a sound nexus between me and my business purposes and hence you give me this particular deduction. As I stated, MCA circular and there have been, I'm told yesterday through certain media reports that there has been an aggressive representation which is made by states to, stay, to say that how can you differentiate between a PM scare fund. Today, everybody is fighting a medical war. Each one is partnering with itself. Never ever India has witnessed a situation where politics would be set aside and a greater cause of nation would be paramount and maybe in the epicenter of a COVID-19 pandemic. Section 80G deduction, therefore, can be given to a PM scare fund. That is very clear. And, and perhaps the question, therefore, would be that for those corporates who are putting money in ATG PM scare fund, which is also eligible for CSR, and those corporates who otherwise are governed by CSR expenditure, to whom CSR applies, may be also be contributing to my state funds because I have exposed, I, I have businesses in those states and I want to contribute equally to both. In that case, the question arises is whether that expenditure is admissible under 371. As I stated, this is factual, but a high possibility of expenditure being admissible under 371. A second question which arises is that suppose I am a corporate, I am an LLP to whom the CSR provisions of 135 does not apply. I am contributing to PM scare fund. I am also contributing to other CSR activity. Can I take a double dip? That is the contribution to PM scare fund be entitled to deduction under 37 and also be entitled to deduction under ATG. If this is the case concerned, there are decisions to support that you can take deduction under both for the simple reason that there is a provision of ATAB under the provisions of chapter 6. That provision delimits, that is it, 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 it cows out the possibility of dual deduction, but it cows out only for those deductions which are forming part of so-called part C. ATG forms part of part B and therefore this is not covered by any limitation. Judgment principles that is judicial exposition have told that you can very well take deductions under both the provisions concerned. I move further to the next point. The next point is like this. Uh, uh, friends, uh, uh, since there are some participants who are entering, uh, as Akshita, Akshita rightly uh, mentioned, and it was my request that we take all the questions at end. There is some journey to, there is some journey to be covered. 
it is possible that as we go through the discourse of presentation some of you would have done or done research on this issue more insightful than perhaps what i have done there may be comments which you would have liked to share with other participant and benefit all but today the time is limited and we propose to cover this particular session up till end at least till one o'clock and then we see if what do we do with questions perhaps we answer them all and or we leave it to the organizers as to how do we take it forward the issue which the second issue comes is that for those corporates who have csr planned expenditure that means that i have done a particular expenditure and csr by its nature while one would have stated it is compulsive but be it as it may be by its nature also gives me a lot of flexibility it tells me that if you have incurred certain expenditure today which is more than what law prescribes you can carry it forward in future years one number two is that i would have done certain planned csr activities where a particular cause of charity would have that is the seeds of a particular charity would be sown in year one it would be nourished in year two and then fruits would be sown in year three four such charity require may require a constant support in terms of csr spending and we have seen those expenditures how how noble our corporate india had been to sponsors and therefore it is possible that they may say they may make a statement or they would like to make a statement that while we are partnering with government while we are incurring those expenditures for the purpose of covid 19 we don't want this to be considered as csr expenditure schedule 7 mentions a whole host of activities what you did was in month of march rightly so to with a very noble intention you added a particular category for me the problem lies is that now when i go ahead and claim the expenditure i am not considering this expenditure as csr for the purpose of corporate accounting i am not considering this csr when it comes to disclosure to the world at large as far as compliance with csr law is concerned i am continuing with a planned corporate planned ngos planned spendings on certain projects which my committee identified and which my board believes is better for the public at large to them the problem is that now there is a particular entry which is added entry is explanation 2 to section 37 a entry of covid 19 expenditure has been added to that schedule which is referred in section 135 to them the question is that how does explanation 2 to section 37 read explanation says it is here by declared that for the purpose of 37 1 any expenditure incurred by an ssc on activities referred to in section 135 shall not be deemed to be an expenditure incurred for the purpose of business lord fo deems that it may be an expenditure even though even though the philosophy even though what memorandum says is that this is nothing but an application of income but the way in which the provision is treated treated it does not say that this is not an expenditure they are deeming this not to be an expenditure what is therefore deemed is an item which is referred to in 371 to them a significant issue will arise that at one hand i am supporting the government cause at large but there are still certain prohibitive explanations which are there which will come in my way for the purpose of deduction this is a very difficult uh, question uh, there are two views possible we thought we debated internally but somehow there are it's it's the, the winds are moving on either side frankly speaking i was not able to conclude not because i want to keep the question open but somehow there are forces in arguments on both the sides here is a case where a particular legislative action may not may may come in the way of availment of deduction to a person who have gone way ahead of what was the mandate of law supported general public at large but still he may not be entitled to deduction also distinguish this particular case with a corporate who is putting money in a covid 19 and classify or mentioning that this i consider as csr spent for the purpose of companies act if such is the case that case is distinguishable to the example which i have given if such is the case without doubt he may spend 4% to the office net earning he may like to carry it forward that case has to be differentiated has to be bifurcated than the case which is being referred present certain novel amendments which was brought in one of the amendment was and rightly so because of lockdown that there was certain spending which one believes generally happens at year end because of the lockdown and the standstill conditions of the nation government stated is that while we are not increasing the financial year that means we keep the financial year as 31st march but we are giving you certain flexibilities if certain deductions which were in the nature of atg atc so on and so forth if you couldn't make it up till 31st march don't worry you can count that as a eligible deduction provided you make it once 
the lockdown opens perhaps the situation normalizes at by 38 june we have seen we have seen the heart of corporate india we have seen heart of certain individuals media was filled with news when it came to certain bollywood superstars in terms of the contributions that they had made it is definitely a matter of pride and it is a clearly a thing which has to be shared which has to be passed on because anything good once it is appreciated definitely it revolves back with a positivity to then there are people who would have counted a particular expenditure level they would have counted a particular income level and computed those things when they would have paid advance tax in 15 march 2020 little did we imagine that the virus which otherwise what was a matter of a whatsapp circulation which otherwise was a matter of certain markets in china which was heavily criticized by each one of us will tomorrow hit me hit my nation and each one of us would be stand still it would be of a pandemic of such a nature that everybody will contribute to whatever extent we can contribute to pm care fund get atg deduction to them the question would be that if i am putting an atg deduction now definitely law is very clear finance act was very clear you can go back in fy 1920 if such is the case there is no 10% limit which is typically applicable for chapter 6, 6 chapter 6 deduction to them they can very well claim refund not only refund along with interest while that may not be the intention of the donor but still the law will work as it is and you can get a refund of those taxes concerned there may be certain cases which would be on the border line say take a case of a corporating who had certain amalgamations or demergers in past while my books of account shows profitability but the past absorption of losses is of such a level or maybe the books are not giving any great profit as far as 1920 is concerned expectation is that maybe those carry forward losses will extinguish so for them if i am making deduction before 30th june 2020 which year do i relate do i relate to financial year 1920 or i relate to financial year 2020 2021 uh, uh okay all right uh now to them the question would be can, can i correlate between two financial years answer to my mind is clearly if you are expend if you are putting expenditure today if you are getting a uh, putting your funds in pm care today it is an option to you law has only given a bit of enabler to those people who wanted deduction in 1920 it is not as if that if i put my money now option goes and it would be clearly open for a taxpayer which year he wants to claim a certain deduction from here as i told and i am again repeating i wish none of the examples none of the illustrations stands true but if at all there are any merits we will still have to deal with certain corporate law implications lockdowns economic downturn of course as i state covid 19 was a biggest shock in otherwise a process of a country which people believed was otherwise going through a, a economic downturn the spike is so deep now that there may be a possibility where certain senior people in corporating would be told that you will have to take a particular pay cut while we are ensuring the people at last level of our organization that they will continue to remain hale and hearty we don't take a pay cut but business can't go this way certain particular people on maybe the top level may either voluntarily also off for pay cut to them there can be a three particular situations one is that there is a pay cut everybody joins together and defo says is that let's move ahead with one or two years future is bright and definitely let us bet for a future rather than being aggrieved by certain pains in short term a particular second situation would be that i say to my all the top employees that let us defer your salaries there is a particular cash crunch which is there once the market opens once things goes to normalcy one predicts and today it is all prediction that when economy will resume when the lockdown or when people can go and people can work in a normal situation one does not know today as i told the world is in hope of a particular surgeon which will come with a magic wand and remove all the cures or maybe remove all the pains to them i tell that there may be certain deferment of salary give away your 50% of salary maybe i am deferring i am not cutting it whenever the cash flow improves i will pay your salary that means it is an assurance to you that don't worry be with us there can be a third part where the deferment is there there is uncertainty maybe if lockdown continues maybe if certain customers of my turns bankrupt i tell to them is that maybe we agreed for a deferment which would be the right thing in today's time 
but somehow you will also have to take a pay cut go away with a particular percentage of salary as far as employers and employees is concerned yes there is certain options which are given that there may be a favorable tax regime don't invest in atcs opt in for a preferential share day you have an option you can exercise those option you can communicate to your employer and therefore then only a certain tds measures would be taken care certain circulars are definitely issued as far as employer the question is that what would be the amount on which tds has to be deducted circulars tells us is that you make an estimate of the salary that means you have to make an estimate whether you are in situation 1 situation 2 situation 3 as in when when you make those particular payments you deduct it at an average rate and hence it is not as if that even if i am getting a 50% pay cut because of a uh, or maybe a 50% cash flow crunch but overall deferral of salary that i would be i would have be sassing to a greater tds obligation second and which should be a right way to do and which may be a right way i am nobody to comment but an esop can be an option which can be extensively used in times like this what are we looking at we are looking at a long term pandemic learned economist tells us that the recovery may be in a u shape recovery may not be a v shape recovery we don't know what happens in future maybe to certain people i would like to say that let's have an esop plan you also be the owners of business agree for a pay cut maybe for a couple of years let us partner together the fruits which you sow today will reap in future when it reaps you will have esops you would be shareholders of the company perhaps an option which can be looked aggressively by corporating to retain talent second can be that there may be certain esop plans which would be there so i would have given esops in earlier time not aware about the pandemic which will follow to them can there be a possibility where the esop committee sits together and rejects esop why the taxation of esop regime is at the time when you exercise those particular shares that is when you sell those particular shares you are getting those particular shares and now you are selling it now it is possible that today my esop plan may be that the shares that the vesting schedules or whatever the esop plan is that event may take place after one year so today i have only a hope maybe my vesting period is also not over can i therefore reject the plan and give those shares to the employees ahead of time if the shares are of listed company and the exercise price is reached maybe an employees can sell the shares in the market for the time being my valuations are to discuss the queued then what one believes would be after 2 to 3 years in that case there can be a lot of tax efficiency which may come employees can again buy the shares there can be a lower withholding which may happens when it comes to an ease of taxation something where there would be a lot of options for corporates to think something where there can be tax efficiency and of course whenever i speak of tax efficiency not at the cost of crossing the lakshman rekha as they say the guards the ppts so on and so forth next question which arises is what would be the impact on my rental income as far as lessees is concerned as far as lessees is concerned from the time the shutdowns have been enforced we have been we have been in a uh, 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 lot of news circulated and maybe advised by lot of lawyers that this can be a force major condition friends force major is a very complicated clause while in simple terms it means that it is an act of god it means that there is certain situations which is a reason where a particular contract will get frustrated corporate contract that gives me certain leeway if my agreements has this kind of clause i can well in back of my commitment that is i may not be required to honor my commitment to them that we have seen we have read it in media we have seen in certain client client conditions that notices are being issued by tenants to say that this is a force major clause i will not pay the rent for the duration of lockdown or maybe things resume in normal this is very much relevant maybe for a shopping mall because one does not know even if the situation resumes to normalcy whether public gathering would be allowed whether i would be allowed to enter into my premises because of overall restriction or guidelines which may come from government to them the question is that what about the rental incomes which i am getting friends as i said when there is pain it is the last thing to take to speak about taxation but it is important thing because tax is nothing but cost it is nothing which debits my bank balance and therefore it is important to give a consideration to tax factors there can be three to four situations which one may envisage that tenant says something like this that a force major clause has occurred i may agree to what tenant says my 
my agreements were drafted in such a manner that it includes academic epidemics it includes pandemic and therefore certain conditions of flows measure is being met and hence my income accrual and hence my rental stops there and there there can be a second situation where my lessee tells to me that i am invoking force measure i based on advice of corporate lawyers say that this is not a force measure clause and i would like to enforce my rent because this is an agreement which is enforceable in court of law there can be second thing that i may be kind to my tenants to say is that i also understand that it has been a significant downturn your maybe if you are a retailer somebody who who, who has shops in various market places maybe you are not able to you don't have any business so i defer your rent but both of us agrees that because the property is at such a prime location that there is only a deferral which is taking place it is not as if we are agreeing for a rental reduction the third case can be the third case can be where my tenant tells something to like something to me like this that here is a case of pandemic forget your rent i am not able to pay my employees we have decided to shut the shop and then i am vacating it there was two to three months which in agreement i am request i am liable to pay you but overall circumstances are such that i am moving back of my commitment treat it as unrealized rent therefore the question is in each of the situation what would be the implications in the hands of recipient what would be the implications in the hands of this if you are seller right employees very limited concern very limited concern in each of those particular situation i am more today focusing on maybe the corporate people who who have taken premises on rent now to the lessers concern there can be an individual taxpayer who is offering cash method of accounting because it is a cash method of accounting certain limited provisions may apply there may be a person who would be offering tax under a mercantile basis of accounting to him certain different provisions apply as far as the chargeability to tax is concerned what is the provisions under the head income from house property provisions are something like this that there are three criteria in which this rental income can be brought to tax first criteria is what is a reasonable let out value something which call which 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 we call called to be an annual let out value as a concept alv as a concept now for properties which has been leased on a yoi basis municipal valuations may not hold true and therefore the reasonable let out value is clearly imprinted by way of things which has happened in past to them the question would be that if my reasonable let out value is higher then what perhaps is the rent received or receivable how do i deal with provisions of taxation to them comes rescue in terms of clause b to 23 they say is that if my actual let out value is higher than alv that is my alv would be a municipal let out value these are questions where somebody has more than one houses i am deeming one house to be sop in nature another houses are not let out in a conventional sense but i have to offer it to tax because exemptions under law are limited then the question is that if i am a municipal valuation there is nothing which i am actually receiving take a case of property which is let out where i am receiving rent which is more than let out value to them 23 1b says is that then consider the higher of the flow rate there is an escape clause which is given and this escape clause is likely to be something which would be a savior in the times of pandemic where actual rent received or receivable is less than alv on account of vacancy then you consider the lesser amount let us see how this each of the three clauses will interplay in the situations which i mentioned first situation is where i accept that this is a pandemic there is a force measure clause there is no point in spending lakhs of rupees on litigation let's accept this and move forward odds are more in favor of lessee than in my favor in that case my property would be vacant because of force measure the entire agreement stops to that extent to that period i may it may be possible for me to take a vacancy allowance allowance under 231c and therefore compare as to what is the annual let out value what is the actual rent which i received for the limited period as a concept annual let out value would be per month rent into 12 months period irrespective whether you have let out the property or not clause c says is that consider the actual let out event consider the lower of it and hence therefore in case of and force measure invocation i may not be asked to pay tax on income which i never earned because of force measure second is an extremely difficult situation to which i have only part answer i only have a limited comment to be made the second is a situation where i say and you assume that i am a person who is otherwise under a mercantile basis of accounting now to him the question is something like this and friends we are only speaking of income from house property when it comes to business and profession we will deal with at some later point 
friends second is a particular situation where i am seeing as a lessee that force major has has been triggered i as lessor believe uh, okay uh, akshita there is some message which is coming if you can confirm again i am audible uh, yes comic you are audible right. and okay. the screen is also visible all right fair fair, fair. some message on my screen heads okay now therefore the second situation is where i believe that force major is not trigger our agreement never envisage this kind of situation perhaps a cut copy agreement from some old age where this provisions are not there in my agreement to them the question would be that now we are in litigation section 23 1b says rent received or receivable now what options which i have one is that i may consider this that this is a rent which is presently not receivable there is no right to receive because of a contingency which has been built in because of the invocation of a force major clause and hence i may like to offer a reduced amount take benefit of vacancy allow and for this year concern i would like to say is that give me the benefit of vacancy allow don't tax me those income which i am myself disputing in a court of law as far as the limited period of lockdown is concerned whenever i win this litigation i offer it to tax as arrears of land as 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 arrears of rental income under 25a and it is not as if i am evading taxes there is a mechanism which is given to me under the provisions of act and hence therefore don't ask me to pay tax on income which i have not earned this has to be married or this has to be reconciled with a corporate with a with a with a general counsel for the simple reasons that there are certain arguments that if you yourself are not accounting this to be a receivable in your books of account you may lose the claim because at first instance you yourself are admitting you yourself are giving rise gave, giving rise to contingency and hence one will have to balance the cause of taxation vis-a-vis -vis my merits of the claim in a corporate court or in a contract court second is a case of rent deferral now here is a case where definitely there is a right to receive the rent is receivable i may fall under 231b so even though i have not received the rent i may have to offer it to tax the third case is where my my where my tenant denies paying me rent liability to them rule 4 of the income tax act comes of the income tax rules comes to my rescue they say that if you fulfill those clauses and what are those condition the tenants vacates your property you have taken sufficient act which can be legal act also to remove him out to enforce that particular amount uh, 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 and various conditions of rules for which have been prescribed if such is the case we will not tax those on on rent this may be relevant in times to come we will only see how things move forward from here uh, just hold yeah interestingly comes a situation where i have got more than one house is concerned to them what do i do i am willing to let, let it out so facts has to bear, has to be borne out there may be a case where i have houses i may have 10 houses i am an hni i don't want to let it out in any case every year i have been giving municipal valuations as an alv it has been accepted by government to them little records rise again follow the same method there may be a case where i would have got house i am making efforts to lease it but because of the pandemic because of lockdown as also because of commercial because i may be having a c facing flat in mumbai i would be charging or having an expectation of rupees x as monthly rent my lessee comes to me and says is that your expectation are not in line with the economic reality i will pay you x divided by 2 to him i say that i don't want to give this property on land and hence because of certain efforts which i did i was not able to let it let out this property come certain decisions at my at my rescue such in tendulkar empire capital uh, and decisions of delhi tribunal so on and so forth here was the cases where a taxpayer was at least able to prove the bona fides of efforts which was taken by him in terms of renting out the property court stated was that efforts was taken benefit of vacancy allowance has to be given even though even though while one reading of law of 231c is that it applies only where a property could not be let out for a part of the year now here may be the case where for entire financial year i was not able to let out the property court was kind enough to bless a particular situation and therefore say is that don't pay property uh, don't pay rent on this property which otherwise you couldn't be let out a negative decision of a particular pnh high court 
SLP has been dismissed. Of course, it is not a speaking SLP. There was a case where bona fides was not brought out. A general proposition in a search in a survey was uh, was stated that oh, here was a case during search survey. I found out that you had more properties. You didn't offer it to rent. I don't give you benefit of 231C and hence bringing it to tax. Decisions will have to be distinguished. Facts have to come out on record. A question arises is that in times where we are, where I cannot even go down and uh, uh, go down, how can I prove my bona fides? One will have to see how swiftly one move, one mobilizes the resources. Can certain advertisement on, on online portal help? When things come to resume uh, normalcy, can certain advertisement in media help? Of course, there would be a facts of bona fide that a property which otherwise fetches 1 lakh, if I ask 10 lakhs, court would not like to bless those kind of situations. Bona fides will have its own role to play. Comes another, another blow to real estate industry or people who hold those properties and stock in trade is section 23.5. This provision, first of all, assumes this provision says something like this. If, if you are holding a property as stock in trade, which couldn't be let out, then your annual value for the period of one year after the end of financial year in which you get an occupation certificate would be nil. Memorandum states or, or the amendment which was brought by 2018 Finance Act moves on a basis that this was otherwise chargeable to tax under the head income from house property. We are not on that debate. SLP of one Delhi High Court has been dismissed. We have to yet to hear the final verdict. Today, we are not on the scope of this particular amendment. Let's move that this amendment is there. There is a reeling real estate industry, which otherwise also was suffering from risk of defaults, risk of its own inability to meet the commitment to, uh, uh, to the flat owners or to the purchasers. To them, this may come as a bit of blow. What is this provision? I again repeat that for a period of one year after the date when you obtain your occupation certificate. So if I have obtained my occupation certificate on 1st April 2020, I say one year after the end of the financial year. Therefore, I don't pay or I don't sub subsume myself to house property chapter for 2021 as also for 21-22. It is only in 22-23 that I have to take I have to take care of this provision. For people who have done it in past, that is, there are properties who have got OC may come under this provision in FY 2021. To them, the question would be how hard this particular provision is made. In my view, again, benefit 23.5 is only an enabling provision. Provisions of Income Tax Act also says to me that I wanted to give you a particular relaxation. Memorandum also says that I wanted to give you a relaxation for one year, and hence I'm assuming ALV to be nil. To them, if you are, if, even if certain pro, pro inventories have not been sold, because one may not, one should not even generalize the cause of this particular industry. If we look Mumbai, something may still be sellable in Mumbai. Limited houses may be vacant. When we look at the real estate in a broader spectrum, go to uh, other cities outside Mumbai, the pain is visible. The pain is clearly visible. To them, what do you do? Maybe in my view, 23.1c may act as a savior, provided bona fides can be established that even though this particular property had dual purpose, one was for the purpose of selling, second is that law fictionally requires me to uh, pay rent, I would still like to take benefit of 23.1c, provided and provided bona fides can be proved that I made all the efforts. It is a case of pandemic, people are locked at home. This would be the last thing in their mind to, uh, uh, to maybe change house, maybe certain uh, properties where otherwise people would would have taken a shift from one city to another maybe because of jobs etc etc everything has came to stand still what law therefore may require and if those decisions of tribunal are true that you still establish that you made enough bona fides to ensure that this property was proposed to be rented of course when i say bona fides i mean bona fides in real sense we are not talking about one or two literature one or two advertisement to uh, to, to, to just to get out of this particular rigor, maybe uh, certain more communication with stakeholders can also improvise on your bona fide sense. Now comes an impact on business and profession. What we are doing is we are perhaps going head by head, uh, various heads which are given under the act, try to see on each of the heads where there can be an impact of COVID-19. Uh, as I stated, last uh, uh, 30 to 35 minutes have certain different variations. And hence, we will move through with this present with with this slides further. We are not taking any questions because 
I suspect that time may be limited if I take questions in between. At the same time, there are questions which are being posed at, uh, at the chat box. We will see how to do with it. Revenue recognition. Now, friends, this has a severe implications when we are looking on the closure of financial years, 31st March 2020. ICDS, whether we like it or not, whether we succeeded in a Delhi High Court ruling or not, is part of law. Significant amendments are made to get over certain rulings of ICDS and therefore to get, get over the ruling of a Delhi High Court decision. What law says is that you have to give equal cognizance to ICDS provisions as you would have given to the provisions of act. Of course, where there is conflict between two, the elder brother takes a super secession vis-a-vis -vis ICDS. ICDS on sale of goods requires that you evaluate. See, friends, before ICDS, I would have taken concepts of right to receive, enforceability, so on and so forth, to test whether this income has to be offered to tax or not. Now, there are cases where ICDS may favor a taxpayer to a certain extent. There may be a right to of enforceability under Section 4, but still certain revenue recognition standards of ICDS wouldn't have been met. Take a case of first bullet which has been mentioned, sale of good. What ICDS says is that you evaluate whether significant, it is significant, not minor, significant risk, uh, significant risk and rewards of ownership have been transferred to the buyer and seller retains no effective control. Friends, lockdown, janta curfew, etc. was on envisage. People never planned and rightly so. Now goods could have been in transit. Essential commodities was that then after after the announcements was given certain leeway that when it comes to essential commodities, we will not disturb you. But when it comes to maybe other goods which were never essential commodity, it is possible that those goods would have been dispatched from my depots, but wouldn't have reached the intended customers. It would have been possible that while I may have an enforceable right over that particular customer where he would have stated that whatever happens, it is my right that I will pay and honor my commitment, but good would be stuck in transit, good would be stuck in ports, good would be stuck in cargoes, so on and so forth. In that case, the ownership of the good wouldn't have been transferred. If such is the case, I may not account those particular in portions of income in FY 1920. Maybe when the time revenue recognition meets, I will have then account it as per ICDS 4. Second and the most important is that you will have to, you can only offer it to tax, that is, you can offer those income to tax when you when you are evaluating the reasonableness of ultimate collection. This is not at an entity level. This can be a contract by contract basis. In the times where we are, the credit risk is the biggest risk which market is foreseeing. It is possible that a particular customer who was hale and hearty may totally go bankrupt. It is possible, and as I said, that COVID-19 comes as a significant blow to otherwise economic conditions where there was a risk of economic downturn. Today, the risk is significant and the debate is whether it is a depression or a recession. Then the question was whether we have entered the recession or not. So those people which were slightly above the surface, slightly above the water, would then at, the, at this moment would totally be submerged because of the economic downturn. The debt burdens would be so large that it may be possible that for goods which, would, which I would have sold even before the lockdown, even before the pandemic enters into, entered into the borders of India, may go bad. And if ultimate collectability is questionable, I may not record it as revenue. Assuming that I record it as revenue, law gives me a sufficient flexibility that in next year, if they, you believe it is now not recoverable, you can write it off as bad debt concern. But here is a case where cash is my king. In FY 1920, if I don't offer this income to tax, I am saving cash in FY 1920 where it matters the most. In FY 2021, it reduces the tax liability of 2021, where in any case my business cycles have changed and hence this provisions has to be looked very, very carefully. As I stated, at times and only at times, ICDS brings opportunities, otherwise at most places, it is more skewed towards the side of the revenue vis-a-vis -vis taxpayer concern. ICDS not only applies to a normal goods, but it also applies to services. Two mandates are given by 43CB read with a particular ICDS, which states that you apply a POCM basis of contract. Second is that even in case of services, you don't apply POCM, but you apply a project completion method. If you believe the duration of the services is more than 90 days. And therefore I will have to see if I'm a service industry, this has to be done line by line, contract by contract basis. 
her friends who are doing tax audit also understand also understand that i have to make a certain comment as tax auditor in terms of my icds compliance a tendency is to give reference to accounting disclosures which are given in my books of account by statutory auditor this 90 days period is not forming part of my auditing standards or fine days or whatever we say this is very peculiar comes out and uh, uh, when we look at the provisions of income tax act and hence there is there would be a need for a, a more care and precaution there may be a possibility that when in a normal business cycle my duration of contract never exceeds 90 days maybe it, those were certain service contract where I sent particular engineer to a factory in Sanan in Gujarat. In that case, the possible that it would only be a duration of 10 to 15 days. Now is a case where these employees are stuck in those particular region. Maybe they would be enjoying in certain hotels, which I will have to sponsor. But as far as compliance of ICDS is concerned, it is possible that 90 days period would have been elongated. One will require a clarification for law as to what do you do for this kind of exceptional exceptionality should i ignore this exceptional period and then look at it on a holistic basis even if i am willing to ignore one is not aware as to when my industries will start when my client will be able to open even if tomorrow india opens up maybe on third may or fourth may as the case may be we are not aware that whether we as professional who are in service industry would have to continue work from home and hence it is eminently possible that certain contracts may have certain difference. How does it matter? It matters to me because for the simple reason that if there is an elongation of 90 days period, I have to follow a POCM pattern. If I would have envisaged a year-end contract, which would have otherwise been over in 70 days period, I would have liked to offer this income to tax in subsequent year where my project would have got completed. But if I am at a stage where my 80% work is over, then law requires me to follow a POCM method. Law requires me to say is that offer that income to tax even in this financial year, FY1920. Certain assumptions which I would have made when I would when I was computing my advance tax would change when we look from this ICDS perspective. Next effect is the placed POCM basis. Of course, it applies to service industry. It does not apply, that is ICDS per se does not apply to developers who are developing in their own rights. But what law says is that you see your POCM basis. Many developers themselves are voluntarily entered into POCM basis. India does not give me an exception to follow a PCM method. And therefore, and therefore, one would have made certain assumptions concerned. Say a case where I am in a construction industry, what future holds for me? We don't know whether whenever lockdown opens up, I will get my ground level workers. I will not, I may not get my field workers. We don't know whether they've already crossed the border and migrated to their hometowns. We don't know whether they are caught in between, maybe while traveling from one state to another, locked at a particular state. Second, we are somewhere in the month of May. This industry will have a lull when it comes to business in the terms of June, July, August, when you're going through rainy season. So maybe when I'm computing my advanced takes in 2021, my POCM assumptions will hold good. I will have to see as to what amount possibly I may offer it to tax. There may be certain commitments which will be on me. Law gives me a sufficient flexibility, Chennai property Supreme Court decision, that if I'm doing a activity of leasing as my business proper, I may not follow a house property chapter. I may be following a chapter under business. In that case, if force major clause is triggered, perhaps there is a questionability in terms of ultimate collection. Perhaps my right to accrue is not being achieved. If therefore that is the case concerned, this income did not be offered to tax. Relevant for shopping malls, relevant for people who have hired their premises to maybe cinema, uh, own, uh, maybe PVRs of the world, so on and so forth. Uh, let's move further. Screen is not moving, but just hold. Yeah. Next comes is interest. Now, what ICDS says is, and to this, there is a separate paragraph in ICDS that when it comes to interest, you account it on a time proportionate basis. Concept of ultimate collection, etc., have been given virtually a go by. It may be possible that I would have lent money to maybe even my subsidiary or to 10 people. The question there is that how do I offer this interest income to tax? Presently, there can be a case where my ultimate collection, which was otherwise sound, would now be under a significant question. There is a circular which came from, uh, uh, from CBDT which says something like this. 
that conditions of reasonable certainty of ultimate collection is not laid down when it comes to taxation of interest. Whether therefore taxpayer is obliged to offer those amount to tax. A wonderful answer. As a principal, interest accrues on a time basis, so we are not willing to go by on the basis of contractual agreements. Subsequent non-recovery, you always have an option to take a claim under 3617. So in a way, what circular prompts me is that even if today my reasonability of collection is missing, still offer it to tax. In view of circular, that is the sound law. But to my mind, there is a case where there is a case that you may go to judgment law. You may go to the principles of accrual. You may go and rely on certain decisions which are on your screen, which have stated that if the reasonable or ultimate collectability is in question, you need not offer it to tax. And hence, perhaps my interest accrual may stop. I will have to wait for the right time. And then if at all I am receiving, perhaps again, the situation changes. This is a case where ICDS is against the provisions of Income Tax Act. As rightly stated in ICDS, I ignore the ICDS and therefore follow the provisions of Income Tax Act. Next are the cases where while there can be uh, uh, certain assumptions and those would be my own internal MI, MIS, my own internal pricing mechanism which I propose. It can be a case where somebody comes to me as a, uh, uh, as a client and states that look, here is a case where I want you to do a particular concurrent audit. I want to, you to render a particular service. I make a man hour estimate and therefore then I say that if I'm incurring 30 days time period, I would like to quote rupees X and that's the end of the matter. Because of this pandemic, two, three things may come in straight. Take a case of a particular contract which I have entered into with my client. Nobody is disputing because I don't want to lose this particular client. But certain assumptions may change. Certain materials which was to be imported from China, I may not be able to get it because even those factories are stuck. My foreign exchange fluctuations have taken a toll. One may believe, one economist may believe that we don't know whether we will come back to the original level which was there when I entered into a contract. Maybe an INR to 72. Maybe the future only tells us that INR may be 80. And therefore, there is a possibility that a contract may turn onerous. There may be a possibility where my provisions of where I believe that rupees 100 was a cost and rupees 120 was my revenue now will immediately change to rupees 220 as a cost. Maybe my people who are there doing that services because of lockdown are, are stuck. It was on me to bear not only the employee cost, but also to bear other incidental costs which may be there in terms of accommodation, housing, logistics, so on and so forth. And hence, therefore, the point is that this contract turns onerous. The question, therefore, is that can I, in this financial year, 31st March 2019, make a provision for this onerous contract, which INDAS will require me to do. INDAS says is that you see what is the economic gain you are, uh, uh, which you may gain from this particular contract. You then just oppose it with the cost which you will incur. If the cost is more, this contract may be an onerous contract. Create a provision for this particular onerous contract. I come to the tax deductibility part of it. Maybe this is a provision. This is an certain liability. This is a contractual in nature. As far as people who are under MAT regime may very well be entitled to deduction because this is not an on a certain liability. Very much a liability which should be deductible for MAT purposes. So my books of accounts may still be in negative. I would have liked to then take a position as to what do I do when I look into my normal computations. And here comes at the root ICDS1. What ICDS1 says is that expected loss shall not be recognized unless there is some another ICDS which gives me certain benefit. There is also a case where a law was amended in order to get over Delhi High Court where 36.118 says that M2M loss and other expected loss shall be only computed in accordance with ICDS. This provision for loss was so much was so much in the mind of legislature that there is one more act, one more provision which was introduced, 4813, which specifically says that no deduction of allowance shall be given in respect of MTM loss or expected loss unless it is allowable under 36118, which again refers back to ICDS. ICDS 1 says expected loss shall not be recognized unless the same is in accordance with ICDS. What is in accordance with ICDS is certain leeways. For us, important is ICDS 10, which deals with provision. ICDS 10 limits or specifically says something like this. ICDS 10 says that provision 
no provision shall be recognized for cost that need to be incurred to operate in future we are talking of onerous contract distinguish this with warranty provisions because these are past obligation i sold a good in past i give them an obligation to which icds grants me reduction if certain conditions therefore are satisfied we will have to distinguish those cases we will have to distinguish with contingent liabilities because those are also cases of certain obligations which was taken in past i distinguish it those cases where icds permits be deduction contract of onerous contracts are those where cost may be required to be incurred in future to that icds specifically prohibits me deduction therefore icds says is that as and when you incur the cost you take deduction don't count on deduction so this kind of provisions of onerous contracts which would be made on 31st march 2020 will not be entitled to deductions Uh, Akshita, uh, uh, yes. visible very much, right? Things yes, are... yes, all clear. All okay. Let's go to the next part of business deductibility. Would be liquidated damages. See, friends, force measures would be a particular clause where there may be certain escape route available, but beyond law lies relationship. Beyond law lies future. Uh, 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 future relationship and possibility of businesses in future. I may not like to displease a particular customer because there is more pain to me because I have incurred the loss today. Maybe I would like to honor him because the business potential of future is much more in my favor than odds which are there in today. There may be a possibility where I would have committed a particular. Things to my supplier. Take a case where a distributor would have committed to take X number of quantity. Because of this particular event, I wouldn't. I I may say that look, I don't want to take this quantity. I don't want uh, to honor this commitment. Let us come to table and settle it. There may be a case where both may engage into a discussion and agree at a settlement point. There may be a case where my goods may be lying at port, and I would have told to my customer that after, if my goods does not reach at up till a particular time. i will compensate you because the my customer in turn would have given further commitments to his own customer so there is a reliance in the entire value chain and hence there would be certain liquidated damages which i may have to take in there may be certain bank guarantees which i would have given to my customer where if i don't deliver till a particular time those bank guarantees would have been enforced in that case it may be possible that all those things would strike calamities have already struck economic calamity may strike and therefore this amounts may be called upon for deductibility significant favorable decisions that these are expenditures for the purpose of business to my mind these are all compensation even if you are making payment to a non resident there is no need to withhold tax under 195 and therefore the law especially as far as this is concerned is clear there is nothing in icds which prohibits me and therefore this amounts would be entitled to deduction take a case of forex fluctuations we were at 70 273 we slowly moved to 74 as the news of pandemic of, of covid 19 started reaching india today where we are after the lockdown tomorrow we don't know where we would be there are certain foreign exchange forex exposures which which a particular taxpayer may have there one will have to follow the mandate of icds in in a true extent if certain things are naked contracts i may be entitled to mtm if there are certain forward forward contracts which would have been taken there is a separate treatment which has been prescribed if there are certain derivatives or certain advanced kind of hedgings which have been taken i need to look out those particular icds i am not going it in detail because we have miles to cover friends with this pandemic certain assumptions would be made and we would have taken deductions based on those assumptions take a case of warranty provisions now warranty provisions are my obligations of past that is i would have sold certain things to my customer i would have sold certain automobiles say a car to my uh, to my various i am an automobile company but i would have sold certain automobile i would be a wide good industry where i would have sold refrigerators air conditions laptop so on and so forth now certain service obligations would be there typical that service has first one year services would be free first two years so on and so forth first five years so on and so forth now because of this pandemic neither i could honor my commitment neither customer could reach my my destination it may be possible that my warranty provisions would be rigid 
I may be like I may like to extend this warranty provision. Ignore the time of lockdown. Maybe for me, a customer saved today is much more valuable than cost which I would be incurred. I may not like to look into those minor uh, stingy aspect of of saving on warranty cost merely because my customer could not reach my shop. And therefore, there would be certain warranty assumptions which would have been made. If a person is following NDAs, the the life is more miserable for the simple reason. That there are certain further uh, 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 further care which one has to take which which one has to take care. Take a case of warranty provision. There may be some elongation of warranty expenditure, and therefore this year end provisions which would be made. Of course, ICDS grants may deduction, but there is some kind of mismatches which we see. There may be a case where certain assumptions of warranty which I would have taken in past. There would be a change in policies of the company. There may be more provisions which I may be required to be made. So, if a person would have bought a car in the month of Jan, I would have made certain presumption. Now, my line, that is my assumption line, would have stretched from 12 months to 15 months, and therefore there may be certain things which would be inbuilt into the revised calculation of warranty. ICDS says is that. Whenever you are computing uh, warranty, you have to apply the principles of net present value. That means there is some discounting which takes place. That is what NDAs says. Uh, there was some mistake, but that is what NDAs says. ICDS specifically states that when you are making certain provisions, you ignore the NPV value. That is, you ignore the discounting to present value concept. And therefore, when I am changing those assumptions in this particular financial year, 30. 31st March 2020, or maybe in the years to come, I will have to marry what I did when it comes came to ICDS disclosures in past year. To what extent my provisions was made ignoring ICDS? To what extent there is a revision again ignoring net present value? This is an extremely difficult task. But here is a case where tax laws are not in sync with what accounting mandate is. Perhaps law in Bharat Earth Commerce definitely stated us that anything which is done on a scientific basis ceases to be an uh, 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 ceases to be un unascertained. The scientific basis replaces it or makes an assumption or an estimate which is good enough for you to claim 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 deduction. Net present value is a sound scientific method, but here is a case where ICDS then therefore takes me away from those sound basis and there would be a significant work in making issue of expenditure. I would be claiming issue of expenditure, special bench in Biocon and multiple tribunal rulings which follows states is that this is a deductible expenditure. It is not unascertain, it is not contingent, so on and so forth. HDFC Bank in a way reads what Biocon ruling says, a tribunal decision, which says is that Biocon is only on a limited proposition that this expenditure is deductible. It is not on the proposition as to how do you account it. It is not on measurement of that expenditure. That question was left open. When it when you come to ESOP expenditure, especially for companies which are following India's, a black and shawl model would be there. Certain old methods of counting fair value measurement, which was intrinsic basis, as we used to say, are not no longer there. One has to go on a fair value measurement. Maybe a black and shawl mode model would be something which 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 would be there now if that is the case concern i will have to see what was the expenditure which i used to claim because if my stock prices are moving in a particular way and friends my my ability to do business in future to what extent i may come back what is the economic scenario in which my industry would be operating today all is questionable if my assumption is that a stock price would be 100 rupees, perhaps it would be 60 rupees today. One may not be able to tell with surety that when these ESOPs reach at a level, when the vesting stage comes, maybe when after that an employee would be exercising it, what would be the what would be the fulcrum or what would be the what would be the presumptions which I make in a black and shawl model that my price will reach 100, which was always there when which was a pre-COVID scenario, if it turns 60, whether those employees would therefore be opting it. Because if my model is such that I would have told to the employee that come at rupees 55 for a stock which I believe would be 100, when these options will write, that assumptions may totally go fraud. Employee may very well say that there is nothing in me and hence I don't want to opt in for such an, or certain options. There is possible that certain provisions therefore may have to take reversal. If these provisions take reversal, for me, this amount would again give rise to taxation under section 41.1. So very, very careful considerations will have to go when we are going further, when we look at the impacts of pandemic on the business side of it. Next is what would be the impact of this particular lockdown shutdown on the fixed asset? 
Now there is a significant disruption in supply chain. I would have imagined that a particular machinery would be would be live when it comes to 1st January. But the people who were engineering this because this machinery was imported maybe from China, I would require certain technical people from China. In the month of January, it was China which was under lockdown. Movements of people in China was restricted. In the month of March, it is India which is in lockdown, whereas China has opened up. And therefore, there is a significant difficulty that my machinery, which I would have otherwise thought would be live and I would be using it for the purpose of my business, would therefore be delayed. And therefore, certain assumptions which would have gone into an advanced text computation, especially on depreciation, especially therefore on other machineries which would be dependent upon the principal machinery, may not hold good. Maybe I would have to analyze in subsequent year what will be, what will, how it will take place. Again, while we say that economy will open up again restrictions on lockdown will be open up one is not clear whether foreign technician to what extent from which country they belong what is what is the zone what is the effect of pandemic on those countries that india will open up the boundaries one is not clear whether a person would therefore come from a new jersey or from an or or, or from a new york or from a uh, uh, from an italy or a spain region will be allowed to enter into my country and hence, therefore, I am not even aware in next financial year whether this machinery would be put to use. Possible that this machinery would be taken on loan basis. That is, I would have sponsored this machinery either for a specific purpose loan or I may be using certain cash pools which would be available as working capital, so-called general purpose borrowing. To that, what do I do? I assume that my capitalization will stop in first of particular month, first of January. India says is that if if your capitalization would be within the period of more, more than 12 months, that is within 12 months concern, you don't apply a borrowing cost principles of India's. What you do is that only if you believe that the acquisition or development would be more than 12 months, then you start capitalizing it. Therefore, an expenditure which would otherwise be on a revenue count under 3613 would therefore may require capitalization because the, my period of 12 months is elongated. Contradict this with what is the accounting mandate of it. Accounting mandate specifically says that if there is a suspension which is there in the present situation, you therefore cannot capitalize this cost. You have to necessarily book it as revenue in my books of account. Great when it comes to MET computation, but when it comes to income tax, I don't have a leeway. ICDS 9 does not give me any leeway. It does not break my chain of capitalization. It trades that compute, consider, continue with the capitalization process and hence entire arithmetic which i would have done because it is not as if that it is qua only a particular asset if i am if i am making a particular factory which was always hoped to be live and kicking will now be seized and an expenditure which i always considered as 3613 deductible expenditure will now qualify as an expenditure which would be capitalized not only will this impact the present year present day condition this expenditure therefore would now form part of my cost of affair asset because it forms part of my cost of asset i would get in deduction only in terms of depreciation under section 32 which would be more of deferral concern so significant impact when it comes to the capitalization of fixed asset second is section 43a i would have committed to my foreign suppliers or i would have committed taken certain foreign currency loan in order to capitalize certain machineries in india in that case what law therefore says is that when you pay those particular installment whatever is the foreign exchange fluctuations you capitalize it foreign exchange have moved to a particular level today when I particularly borrowed it, it would have been an INR to $70. Today it is $75, $76 and we don't know where it will move. So Section 43A capitalization may also kick in. Write-offs may be there. Advances to supplier may go fruct. All of these are business deductible expenditures. So one will have to see as to what do I do. A question arises is that at what point I write it off. TRF decision, Supreme Court stated that leave it to the business. The day when you write it off, it would be deductible expenditure in context of bad debt. To my mind, of course, with certain negative decisions from tribunal, should also apply to advance to supplier. But it should not be a case where I just want to reduce my tax liability for SYFI 1920 because I know in 2021, I'm in any case not going to make any, any gain. So artificially write off all the advances is saying that now I believe that these things may not turn. But those suppliers may, may start selling or may start honoring their commitments in 2021. Such is not the case which I am speaking about. 
expected credit loss. Now, this is what we call popularly known as provision for bad and doubtful days. Of course, this concept applies just not for bad and doubtful days. This is an in day as concept. What does this concept mean? Is something like this. In a non in day as kind of a regime, suppose uh, a normal accounting standards which we follow, typically when I'm accruing certain provisions for bad and doubtful debt, I would just like to give a position of what is the past as far as business was concerned. What is the normal bad debts in my business? Is there a scientific basis to compute it? Is there an industry average of one, one and a half percent? And then I account those things as provision for bad and doubtful debt. Once I account for it as provision for bad and doubtful debt, certain explanations to 3617 triggers, and I add it back as far as normal provisions is concerned. Interestingly, as far as MAT is concerned, we have a full bench decision in case of Vodafone, subsequently followed by other high courts as well, that even though it is a provision for bad and doubtful debt, it is, does, it is not hit by any of the disenablers of MAT provision. Courts have stated is that there is a difference between an uncertain liability and the liability which we are seeing, because it is accounted on a scientific basis, it is definitely not an uncertain liability. Courts have also stated that this is not an impairment of asset, this is something different. According to court, the impairment happens only when this amount is reflected in liability side of balance sheet. If this is reduced from asset side of balance sheet, according to them, this is a write-off. According to them, this is not a provision and therefore entitled for bad deduction. Coming back, expected credit loss method. Now, here is a case where India's requires me just not to live in past. This was done in order to come out of 2008 Lehman Brothers or economic crisis. What law says is, or what the fair value measurement says is that you also look at the future conditions. You will have to bet on future. And once in the conditions where we are, I am asked to bet on future, I may therefore come in certain difficulties because we don't know how future is. Perhaps my provisions may increase and that may have definite tax implications. With that comes an interesting part of debt restructuring. Certain institutions, certain entities may go down the wire. They, there may be a case where certain debt renegotiations may take place. RBI in certain recent and one believes and it has been asked of industry that permits certain debt restructuring. Precedent in 2008 Lehman Brothers crisis, RBI permitted certain debt restructuring where based on those debt restructuring, I was not classified as NPA. I may be having a sound business model, but the pandemic is of such high in nature that I may not be able to honor my commitment. Banks would be forefront in terms of renegotiating that loan, renegotiating their loan. What ICDS says is, and it is a litmus test which is applied, that if NPVs, that is ICDS requires the loan to be accounted in a particular manner, if they say that your contractual cash flows differ by 10% than what was there in a pre-negotiation era, then you de-recognize your all the past liability and you recognize your new liability at the revised cash flow basis. That is at the revised NPV method. If this is the case, it is possible that when I'm going into some kind of a, a, a debt restructuring, certain amount may be converted into a loan, certain amounts may be having a I may have some prolonged period, I may be pushing back certain EMI, certain uh, interest accrual, and my overall cash flows would change by 10% concern. If such is the case, then I have to revise, that is the gain or loss, I may have to account it in my profit and loss statement. If there are certain instruments from debt which are classified into equity or a preference share regime, it is possible that there may be a gain vis a vis my precondition. It is this gain which has to be accounted into my profitability. Under the provisions of normal tax, I would have stated, under the provisions of normal tax, I would have stated that these are and gains which are not income in nature. There is nothing of, uh, of waivers which have happened and hence you don't bring me to tax. Perfectly fine argument. Question arises in context of MAT computation. These are the taxpayers who have taken an option and hence I said that one will have to critically evaluate the positions whether I continue under a normal tax regime or I opt in under a 115BAB regime. Uh, just hold on. Here, when I am putting this credit into my PNL account, maybe the safeguards would be the decisions which are on the screen, which have stated that MAT provision still lies within the provisions of Income Tax Act. It may be an alternative way to compute tax, but if certain things are not income in the way in which it is, 
in if it, if it is not recognized as income under the provisions of act in that case you cannot even bring those income to tax under the provisions of the mat computations even under income tax act some of the decisions here quoted deals with subsidy some of the decisions here deals with certain exempt income so on and so forth in my view possible to take up stand that this should not also be offered to mat under the provisions of law next would be the situations where i would have given loan to my subsidiary concern my the subsidiary would now be in a situation of bankruptcy i again repeat that there was an economic downturn which was making noises this comes at a high, economic uh, the covid 19 comes as a significant hammer it may change it may change the uh, just hold on uh, just hold on it may therefore change certain assumptions uh, ek minute okay Uh, it may therefore change certain assumptions which i made my subsidiary would not be in a position to pay it may be possible that i may be asked to go into either a debt negotiation ibc proceedings would again be enthroned upon me or it may be a possibility that we all take a call that subsidiary will not be able to pay my loan and hence there is a write off of loan which takes place as far as parent is concerned what is the deductibility or chance of deductibility of this write off courts largely are in favor of the view that it may be a possibility that 100% has been written off because of economic downturn or out of rupees 100 you are only receiving rupees 10 to the extent of 90 which you have, which you have missed this is not a business deduction your activity is different it was merely a lending activity it was a case where i paid rupees 100 but i received rupees 90 you will have to prove as to how this is for the purpose of business concern how this is for the purpose of business concern if i am able to establish that there is a live link between b and my business if i am able to establish that borrower company is nothing but a special purpose vehicle that law required me or maybe there was a case where where maybe i am in a renewable energy where i had to necessarily do activities in an spv spv based model each state gives me different kind of certain concessionary arrangement and therefore spv is nothing but an extended part of my business this is nothing but my own capital going fraud in those cases it may be a different case where there can be a deductibility of loan concern but if your case is largely a case where my spare i was only funding my subsidiary to do its own business decisions does not give us any confidence to merit a business deduction under 371 or 28 concern there may also be a possibility there may be also be a possibility where bankers would have given where bankers would have given nay i'm just coming back where can i improvise can i improvise my situation from here suppose suppose we concluded that the chances of getting deductions are low there are more decisions unfavorable than favorable at least the jurisdictional high courts does not give us any support concern can therefore what i do is and and again i am seeing that any of the illustrations from here which we make and in next maybe 30 to 50 minutes we we'll leave it to the organizers if we can push it by 10 minutes but in next 30 to 40 minutes which we whatever we do there may be certain statements which i may be making it has to be supported by fact it has to be supported by a business case there is sufficient anti abuse ammunition which is there in the provisions of income tax act any planning which you do may not hold water coming back to the same example where my subsidiary was high and dry i believe that i may not be able to recover money from my subsidiary or at least out of rupees 100 i may not be able to recover say rupees 70 or a substantial amount of money can i therefore think of assignment assigning this particular loan to a banker who is willing who is who is willing to monetize this particular asset who is willing to accept this particular asset or at whatever cost it was maybe the securities or collateral which subsidiary is willing to offer bankers believe that there is too much skin in the game and hence a rupees 100 loan has been discounted by me and rupees 20 is realized in that case if there is an assignment of loan courts have stated it courts have stated that this is nothing but a capital asset if it is a capital asset there is a loss which you have incurred this may be a capital loss which you, which would be in a way uh, a, a capital loss under the head capital gain i may be able to set it off against the gains which i may be picking in future jurisdictional high court minor by my minor bay by which is a gujarat high court etc does support me take a case of loan waiver 
borrowers that is my own subsidiary would have taken loan from third party bank economic downturn is of such wide nature my financial ratios have taken its as low as it can be and here is a case where bank is willing to renegotiate with me and i am willing to renegotiate with a banker to stay say is that don't take me to ibc court i believe that if you take me to ibc court you may be realizing 5% of total revenue if you come with me to me on a settlement basis i can still pay you rupees 40 out of rupees 100 my borrower believes that there is a sound case to restructure my entire loan and therefore is willing to waive off my 460% of loan to that the question in the hands of subsidiary to that the question in the hands of borrower is what do i do as far as the rupees 60 is concerned or the 60% of waiver is concerned we have a bombay we have a supreme court decision in a peculiar facts which was dealing with certain borrowings for capital asset court has stated is and i am again on a normal tax provisions i am not on mat provisions at this moment under the normal income tax provisions court has stated is that you can't tax it under 28 4 because 284 restricts only certain benefits you get in kind this is a benefit in cash you can't tax it under 411 because you never took deduction for this loan in preceding years and therefore supreme court in mahindra mill says that this is a decision which says that you cannot tax it under the heads normal normal heads under normal provision and therefore a significant benefit a significant savior as far as the borrower company is concerned it is equally possible that some of the loans would be such where where i would have either taken an operating loan that is i would have taken a working capital loan a certain term loans which were more in an operating nature and the question is that how far a decision of mahindra mahindra applies even to an operative portions of loan even to certain working capital loans which which was there to my mind subsequent decision in case of compact helps me what was the decision there a court at a lower level that is i in best of my memory it was a gujarat high court but participants may test it may check there independently was dealing with a working capital loan matter went to supreme court supreme court dismissed the slp but slp was dismissed with a particular observation observation was in any case this while the dismissal the reason of dismissal was that the tax impact which was involved in the appeal did not meet the criteria which was there and therefore the slp was dismissed at the time of dismissal of slp supreme court observed that in any case this is covered by mahindra and mahindra decision a principle of interpretation therefore is that if slp is dismissed with certain observations then it also becomes a law which is binding on everybody to my mind benefit of this particular decisions may well in taken and as far as subsidiary is concerned as far as waiver of this loans are concerned there may not be any tax liability as far as mat provisions are concerned it is extremely debatable it is questionable whether a company would be able to save him from mat if i opt under 115 bab there is no question of mat i am here happy i am hale and hearty and therefore one more decision making point but for whatever reasons but for whatever reasons i subsume or i would like to continue to bet it is a questionable proposition as to how far we will succeed a mumbai tribunal of course a mumbai tribunal decision of course supports me that i would succeed here but it is still a tribunal decision there is a journey to travel and therefore on mat front it is question i am pausing here and putting just a question for people can one be more creative can there be a case where a borrow where i try to be more creative and even try to come out of mat i try to come out of 411 concern certain structures can be there where perhaps a parent company either himself or through a special purpose vehicle that is i incorporate a new subsidiary concern i incorporate a new subsidiary new subsidiary or a parent company himself because what is the question here two questions whether 411 applies to a working capital loan a view possible but as i said it is just a view time will test to what extent the ratio of mahindra mahindra and mahindra can be stretched even for working capital loan if the odds are against if the odds are against that is you cannot stretch an mnm decision if somebody tells that mnm decision was dealing with a loan which was taken for capital purposes does not apply to a loan which was taken for working capital purposes can there be a need where certain when uh, one can act more safeguardedly one can act more cautiously it is possible that parent company may pay rupees 40 that is 40% of that and and novates the entire loan 
which was there with the banker to himself. That is, I pay banker rupees 40. I take that asset, which is loaned to the borrower company, which is my subsidiary company in my book, in my books of account. Therefore, as far as banks and operational creditors are concerned, they are taken care of. Their claim is satisfied. Terms of corporate debt restructurings are being met and they are willing to waive off the balance. Now, there is a case where in the books of my subsidiary, rupees 100 appears. In my books, rupees 40 appears. I enter into an agreement with my subsidiary and then therefore say that in any case you are going to pay rupees 40, pay me 40% of the debt. Subsidiary is willing to pay 40% of the debt and the balance debt is in a way written off. In DS will permit me, in DS will permit me to therefore classify this as parent, as contribution from a parent in my other equity and therefore a credit to a profit and loss account should be avoided. This treatment to my mind and of course subject to auditors confirmation, subject to seniors in professional who are on audit side to confirm this, I may be able to avoid met, met liability. It is equally possible that I may incorporate an SPV after this debt restructuring is happens, I may just merge this HPV with borrower company or borrow or merge all the two companies with myself and thereby canceling all the intercompany transaction, thereby avoiding perhaps a charge of 411. As I stated, these are all emerging thoughts. Each one have to see how it can happen. One will also have to test the merits of whatever I am saying. By no means this should be uh, uh, applied uh, in, a, uh, in a rudimentary manner. There is a lot of work which has to be done whenever one is trying to uh, 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 change the transaction from a usual pattern to something different. Let's move ahead with from this to a case to a case where there where I have got two possibilities. One is a case where I have to enter into a settlement concern because the stakes are at large. I don't believe that the businesses have reached to a stage where I shut the shop, I close for a shutdown, I go to IBC and as promoter give away all the rights over my business concern. I am willing to enter into a renegotiation with borrower. I am entering into a, uh, uh, that is the parent company or the borrower companies and willing to enter into a, some kind of a settlement scheme with borrower concern where I'm saying that I would like to pay 40% of that, give away, you give away 60% of that. As far as balance terms are concerned, why don't we extend the terms, which was otherwise five years to a 15 years period, give me certain moratoriums. Banker says that give me 40% and I'm willing to cooperate for the next 60%. Securities which was which you otherwise offered maybe the promoters pledge have today very limited market value and hence I will force you to come and sit on table. If such is the particular position, borrower question would be I may have two options. Either borrower himself does not have liquidity, parents will have to infuse that liquidity and borrowers will have to enter into the settlement scheme. Second option can be that I myself as parent have given certain covenants, have given certain guarantee to the bank concern. I say to the bank and therefore banker and therefore banker even under the revised scheme enforces that guarantees and I am asked to pay money which otherwise subsidiary was to pay. Question there is, the question therefore there is, the question therefore there is that whether subsidiary would be entitled to claim this particular deduction or that is the question therefore is whether parent company would be entitled to claim this particular deduction where I am honor, where I am honoring my obligations as guarantor. Quotes have been divided here again, but facts are very interesting. If I am able to prove that my honoring of commitment was only to facilitate my business purpose, maybe the securities which I offered with banker because my borrower or subsidiary had no legs of its own had no legs of its own and therefore the securities which I offered with the bankers was such that I had to come to a settlement, maybe take a case where I was into a real estate business. I offered collateral to the property which is presently under construction. My borrowers have, has gone fraud and the bankers are behind me to honor the commitment. Maybe because over this property I already started a construction work, I have committed to my own customers that I will complete a project beyond a particular time. If borrower thereafter pulls the trigger and tries to take hold of this particular underlying asset, it may badly impair my business concern. And therefore it is very much possible that had parent company enforce this particular obligation, it would be classified as a business expenditure. As against that, if I had to infuse capital into my borrower company, that capital wouldn't be a business expenditure. Clearly a lot of maths, a lot of work which has to be done. 
law today where it is and the economic reality where it is gives me a lot of options it is for me as business to see what option a and i am again repeating has to meet the tenor of law meets the test of bona fides and thereafter i move anything which is done in artificiality is a temporary hallucinated relief which would give a temporary relief with a whole host of litigation whole host of penalty interest and tax consequences which may follow moving further on that restructuring part this was some examples which i proposed to take there can be a possibility there can be a possibility where cash is not with me but i need cash cash may be with my parent company cash may be with my subsidiary company cash may be maybe maybe with my sister subsidiary company cash may be with my foreign companies outside india and today where we are cash is definitely the king it may either support me to stabilize my operation in a given marketplace may help me to be a king maker in a given situation i uh, 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 there may be certain competitors or certain business which i always wanted to acquire are now available at a uh, Dot, dot cheap valuations and therefore there may be a need to move cash from one place to another it is here that cash pooling would be an important consideration assuming assuming that i am a parent company and my subsidiary requires cash the question therefore is that what options i have to them it may be a clear clear case of a business transaction where i will have to pump equity into my subsidiary company various options are there and various consequences follows as far as taxes are concerned simple option is put an equity into it one lump sum amount if i am a parent company if i am an overseas company section 56 to 7b does not help does not trigger if i am a resident company 56 to 7b is another consideration we will come to it as we conclude the presentation on 56 to 7b and 56 to 10 but when it comes to equity by its nature it is block it's one lump sum payment second option can be an ecb kind of thing of course it with ecb comes fema compliances with fema comes certain end use restriction concern but from a cash flow management perspective it is not as if the money is lost forever whenever subsidiary turns the table whenever the economy turns well in motion whenever the world resumes operation at to back in normalcy maybe i would be able to give the money back to subsidiary clearly it's not a dead capital but i will have to check other implications in terms of 5% of withholding so so a parent company will give rise to some kind of a tax cost in all year as far as 94b to the indian company is concerned i will have to check what my ebitda will look like and therefore something which appears to be a tax deductible in nature visa vis equity may not be a tax deductible expenditure let's look at another options ncd whether i list it whether i keep it unlisted so on and so forth only advantage visa vis ecb is that there are no end use restriction now comes important propositions which would be of interest to mnc's which are operating in india that while indian operations are very much there i may be a cost plus entity i may be a kpo i may be a bpo concern but my parent company requires cash in that case what do i do in that case what do i do one option which was erstwhile assumed to be very costly is now available to me on table i may very well declare dividend to them if the if the parent is from a treaty favorable jurisdiction i may have a 5% tax rate if it is from numerous other jurisdiction there may be a 10% tax cost money can move immediately if i am from certain treaties which are like netherland france sweden so on and so forth i may have to evaluate whether i can take benefit of mfn clause significant controversies given and dot close clause concern today my role is not to take you through those provision but there is significant things even before you take the benefit of mfn of course if you are taking a treaty benefit other addendum things has to be seen on a safeguarding front whether provisions of car can be invoked whether i am beneficial owner whether i have a tax residency certificate so on and so forth another interesting options would be now take a case where either i may be having a cash at my foreign subsidiary level or the subco 2 which is in your screen may not be a foreign subsidiary may be just a group company into an entire vertical chain the cash may be required by the indian company at the uppermost level of your screen concern can i use certain provisions under income tax act which gives me leeway therefore there is provisions of atm concern which tries to mitigate or tries to eradicate a dividend tax which would be there if i look at the chain concern 
Therefore, can there be a possibility that Subco 2 declares dividend to Subco 1? Presently, assume all of them are domestic company. We see what happens when there is a non-resident company in between. Can there be a possibility that Subco 2 declares dividend to Subco 1? Thereafter, Subco 1 claims benefit of AP, ATM. That is, it does not pay, pay any, any, any tax when it receives the dividend. That dividend goes and gets declared by it and reaches ICO 1 concern. Then the question therefore would arise is whether this amount is taxable in the hands of Indian company. With the amendment in law, it is taxable in the Indian company provided other conditions are satisfied. That means that if the Indian company itself has certain carried forward business losses in the existing year, that is if I am likely to incur losses in FY 2021, this dividend forms part of other, in other sources, business losses within the same head within the same year can be set off against income from other other sources and therefore money which was at a subsidiary two level can reach indian company without any further tax cost involved it is equally possible in this case that the subsidiary company two may be a foreign company so when it declares dividend to subsidiary one subsidiary company one may be subject to 115 bbd i may have to pay tax at 15 percent concern Thereafter, whenever I declare dividend to Indian company, it will not give rise to any further tax because ATM rollover relief is also entitled to the dividends which I receive for foreign country. But if Indian company does not have, if Indian company does not have any further losses, it may be taxable in its hands, maybe at 25% if it's opting for 115 BAB or maybe at a tax rate of 33 or 36 percent if i'm not opting for customer tax regime for subsidiary company too when i am receiving dividend there can still be a cascading effect because the relief of atm is available only under normal provisions as far as matt is concerned once dividend is reflected into the credit side of my pnl account that may be subject to matt taxation clearly a lot of maths clearly a lot of arithmetics which one will have to do as against that, can there be a possibility where because my Indian company is a profitable company that I, I may give rise to a tax liability. That, that tax liability therefore may be that tax liability therefore may be at a 25 or a 36 percent. In that case, subsidiary company too, if it has an extra float with him, may consider doing up adopting a buyback option, pay tax at 23.3 percent, which may still be less than 25 or a 36 percent that amount is not taxable thereafter in the hands of subsidiary on account of 1034A exemption. So money reaches me. Of course, buyback has its own negatives. One of the negative is that I cannot distribute entire cash pool which I have available. I need to restrict it to the quantums or the limits which are prescribed under section 68 concern. There may also be a possibility here where I may think of directly merging Assuming it is a foreign subsidiary which is there, if I am a profitable company, if my first level subsidiary is a profitable company, underneath company a certain excess cash pool which was available, we take a call that because of the pandemic nature, because of chain business situations, as well it was a distributor entity, but we now no longer want to supply our product maybe to the countries which are highly impacted by pandemic, to the countries where economic risk is so high that there may be a case of credit default and hence the cash is lying idle in those foreign countries. I may consider directly folding those companies with me in by, by, by adopting over, by adopting or taking benefit of certain overseas mergers or demerger provisions which are now permissible under companies that concerned. If I merge this subsidiary too into my own fold, in that case, it is totally a tax neutral transaction. It does not give rise to any tax liability concern. Of course, questions would be there in terms of GAR, in terms of other, other anti abuse provisions as to why did you do this structure? Was it that there was an excess cash which was available? Business commercials, business modified, as I've been speaking throughout this particular presentation, we'll always have an upper edge. If you are doing something only for tax purpose, your happiness is only momentarily before a particular law catches you up. Moving further, there can be a possibility where I've got money which is there within my sister subsidiaries, subco one, subco two. In this case, I need to take care of deemed dividend provisions. Can I take benefit 
can I therefore take benefit when I move money from one subsidiary to another subsidiary of certain instruments which are there? Can I therefore subco one subscribe to uh, subscribe to redeemable preference share of subco two which required money? If that is the case, you will not be caught by section 79 because section 79 that means I at the same time will have to safeguard that the losses which I carry forward. Simple option was put an equity from subco one to subco two. If I, if I would have done it then there may be a breach of 51% condition. I may thereafter have to rely whether a beneficial ownership always it was with ICO. But I don't want to enter into any judiciary argument because today while cash is the king, I also need to ensure that my litigation cost is also at its at minimal. Otherwise, there will be a money which would be clogged with the litigation. I may subscribe to redeemable preference share, clearly shares which does not carry voting right, not to be counted for the purpose of section 79. At the same time, something which does not attract the dividend provision. Some of the decisions which are on the screen also helps me. Second option can be to put an intercorporate deposit, whether it attracts deemed dividend provisions or not, something which is highly debatable to them. Certain decisions are in my favor, certain decisions are not in my favor. Suffice to say there is a lot of work and that's what I stated when I started this presentation, that the role of consultants would be dual fold. I may at some time be asked to be take, taking a role of advisor. At some times I would be a watchdog trying to red flag certain things which may not be permissible within law or may give rise to a significant tax exposure concern. Next comes shares and securities. Now friends, stock market could be as volatile as, as it can be. We are seeing mood swings. So people who had invested in a pre-COVID-19, they are seeing their portfolios getting eroded by 50 to 60 percent with certain corrections, which brings a lot of hopes on a day by day basis. A mood swing, which is there within the market also, where sometimes markets are increasing by 1500 to 2000 points and very next day we are seeing the markets in green. Now, stock market is always a question of perceptions. Now, there are people who have invested significantly but their portfolios have totally eroded. And there are still the same people or some other people who believe that these are opportunities in the making. Some of the analysts, as we see media, states that this is once in lifetime opportunity. Such opportunity does not come because fundamentals of countries are otherwise impact. Frankly, I don't know which way to move, but there are people who would like to make most of these opportunities. For the people who invested few weeks back in time when market was at ad low, they already have accounted a 20 to 22 percent gain, a uptick in terms of what price they acquired and what price the stock is today. Analysts say that after one year or whenever it is, the prices are bound to improve. You will have gains which may be multiple. And then one will have to weigh that there is one end, I have got a portfolio which is definitely in losses. My cost of acquisition is way above 31st March 2018 value. Is way above if after purchased after 31st January 2018. It is way above all the computation mechanism which is given under the Act. To those people or to the tax consultant, a decision will have to be taken whether I sell those shares today, rejig my portfolio in our entirety, buy those shares again, but book losses today, which can be carried forward, which may perhaps act as a cushion, which may act as an ammunition. When tomorrow I sell the shares which I purchased during the market downturn at a significant premium, I may not be required to pay tax at that point in time, something which people will have to take account. The next provisions are extremely difficult provisions are the brothers, are the, are the twins brothers, which forms part of section 56 family. 56 to 10, 56 to 7 B, 50 C A, which is nothing but a mirror of 56 to 10. What are these provisions? This provision therefore says is that if you buy shares at a level which a rule 11 UA will try to corner me, if you buy a share at a particular price, which is less than an artificial law benchmarking, then you don't need to pay tax or you will have to pay tax under 56 50 CA or 56 to 7B concern. There may be a possibility where there may be certain stress buyouts which may be happened in market. There may be certain promoter driven companies who may not be able to withstand this kind of resolution to them. They may be forced to sell shares at a discounted price. Maybe I sell certain part of my share 
continue to be invested as a shareholder by losing control of 51%. But when I look the big picture, it was perhaps the best call which I could have taken in the times where we are. So I tried to sell certain things to my joint venture partner. Reason can be that I myself have taken loan erstwhile for infusing money into the company. I want to get over certain debts which was there of past. So I'm selling off the shares at a value which may be less than 50 CA value, which may be less than 11 UA value. To them, the question therefore arises is that will section 50C to 10 apply in the hands of investor who is buying the share or whether 56CA will apply in the hands of promoter who are selling the shares. Decisions have, are there to support that a law needs to be seen on a pragmatic basis. 56 to 10 and maybe now 50CA are an anti-abuse provision. KP Varghese may apply and therefore there may be an argument to say that you don't apply those decisions to me. If you those apply those decisions to me, it would lead to an immediate precarious, precarious consequences. Here is a case where a shares of rupees 100 would be sold at rupees 60. The reason was that economic conditions was such. I was reeling in so much debt. I was reeling in so much financial distress that I had no option but to sell to 60. Whom did I sell? I would have sell to somebody who was a JV partner to me, who gave me an assurance that after I sell the shares, he would be putting some green capital into the company. So this was not a pre ordered transaction where a black money was supposed to be changed into or, a, or into a different color concern. This is a genuine transaction. 56 to 10 is not taxable at the concessional rates which capital gains would otherwise be. It is taxable at a rate which can be a peak rate if you are an HNI 42% concern or depending upon your slab rates as we see. To them, these provisions can be an extreme, extreme draconian effect. To my mind, decisions on Mumbai Tribunal Subodh Kumar interpreting KP Varghese should hold water. But if these decisions are downturned, and these provisions are looked on a rigid basis, it can give rise to a significant financial stress to the people who would be selling the shares, to the investor who is buying the shares on the trust that tomorrow would be better, we would together can revive a particular company concern. If one can recollect the words of Mr. Palkiwala here, it would only be something like a humor in a graveyard. Moving further is another provision of 56 to 7b. 56 to 7b says is, that if you put money into the company at a particular value, which is above the fair value, and what is this fair value? Either a book value based calculation, which is under 11 UA, or you appoint a merchant banker and get a DCF valuation, provided, of course, this applies to people who are resident, the shareholders who are resident, to them, there are a number of questions which will arise in a COVID-19 situation. Assuming my subsidiary is going through an economic downturn and I have to capitalize that subsidiary, today, how I can value the shares of this company. There is too much variables in the market where there is too much variability. There is no surety. There is no particular trend where my cash flow I can predict visibly. It may be possible that I may be predicting it considering the economic reality. Who knows tomorrow there may be a V-shape uh, kind of economic bounce back. Things may turn better. And there the question would be that when you infuse the money into the company, the stick of 56 to 7 we would be questioned. There my valuation should be questioned because what the law on valuation at this moment as it appears, looking at tribunal decisions is like this, that when you are issuing the shares, you will have to see what was the reasonableness of the assumptions which you make. In order to test and purely test the reasonableness of this assumption, you can see what was the cash flows, what was the business, what was the profitabilities in future here. If there are significant difference between the two, questions would be asked to you as to prove that whatever valuations you did when you issued the share. This question is not restricted to today or promoters who are trying to capitalize their company. This can be a question for people say in one year before who infused money into the company. To them also I would have taken a cow of four to five years. I would have applied certain cash flow presumption, certain discounting rate, certain risk premium which would have been built in, which are materially different in a time when we look at the economic downturn post COVID-19. To them also there would be a significant difficulty which may arise. A solution therefore is only revisit the assumptions which was made when you made those class flow assumptions for the purpose of 56 to 10. Document clearly as to there was an impact of COVID-19. Document clearly that my prime customer 
because of the economic downturn created in his business because of COVID-19, stop purchasing goods from me. My cash flows got impacted. My rate at which I was otherwise borrowing was 10% because I don't have enough securities. I am being asked to borrow at 14%. So there are significant change which have taken place. Friends, in my view, and this is more of a representation point, that there is a provision which is this 5627 which looks at the world with suspicion. It does not trust a businessman. The provisions are draconian to an extent that when a person stands in front of a mirror, provision says that you don't even trust yourself. You may be my parent company. As long as you are a resident company, you need to comply with section 56.27b. One provision which should be omitted with immediate impact if economy has to bounce back, if businesses has to move at a right level, without the concern or without any interference from a tax authority concern is removal of 5627b. If it continues in statute, it can give rise to significant surprises. Once we move forward, maybe situations may change, situations may emerge. This brings me to certain implications of international tax. I'm just putting it as points. There have been separate forums. There have been separate BCS discussions, which itself have taken place as part of this uh, organization is a question of locked down which happened. What would be the impact on residential status? There have been people who have been locked down compulsorily being asked to stay in a country. My change of rules have taken place. Now there are three criteria: whether you are less than 120, whether you are between 120 to 182, whether you cross 182 days. Lockdown happened since 25th March. All the international flights were being asked to be aborted. Different states took different view. Certain countries were prohibited from coming in or Indian people were prohibited to go out. In that situation, how do I look at the residential status? Significant debate, significant thoughts which have already gone in. I'm only putting one thought on this particular topic. A financial year will end when we are looking at 31st March 2020. The law is that if you cross 182 days for a person who was of Indian origin or a person or a PIO card holder, as we say, or a person who was Indian citizen, to them, a question would be that if I have crossed 183, 184, 185 days, what would be my tax consequences? There, if you, if the facts support that you came to India, maybe for your own marriage purposes, you came to India to see your father because there was certain medical surgeries which was planned. You came with a return ticket in your hand, but because flight could not operate, you were forcefully stuck in India. Perhaps those cases would be similar to the cases of Suresh Nanda. There may be the people who planned going outside India, could not go out, maybe because 120, 182 days uh, period stage. To them, there cannot be any bona fides which you can prove because what you planned was always in your brains. How do you prove the bona fides to a government official? How do you prove bona fides to a judiciary that it was a compulsive scenarios where I'm asked to lock down? A general statement that even if I want, I cannot move out may not suffice in the times where we are. Facts will definitely be there. Similarly, implications would be on permanent establishment. When we look at construction fee or a service fee, there are certain duration tests which treaty says. So if you cross 90 days, if it was here in India, UK treaty, if you cross 90 days period, you may give rise to a service fee. There may be cases where the technicians would be stuck in India and you would be crossing those duration. Question to them would be, will you exit or will you subject those foreign enterprise to taxable presence in India? In cases of permanent establishment, problems are not restricted to a PE kind of situations. Once you have a PE in India, even the employees who are a foreign enterprise may, give, may have taxable presence in India because the short stay exemption is thereafter not there and therefore you it may give rise to the taxability of those employees in India. Certain guidelines coming from OECD which says that these are exceptional situations. You remove those exceptional situations. Only look at those active days which are a business proper days and thereafter subject a foreign enterprise to tax in India. We will have to see to what extent these guidelines would be accepted in times to turn. Transfer pricing, lesser we speak, the better it is. For the simple reason that the concerns would be largely as to how the businesses will move. To all the PPTs, to all the presentations which we did, there was something known as law and there were certain situations which we were envisaging and the law was, dying, law was constant. 
when it comes to transfer pricing the law is limited law only gives certain guidance in terms of how do i benchmark or what are the methods how do i move forward to them it is the business which generally takes a step further than what law is and thereafter you put those business situations within the law we don't know when we look at 2019 when economy will open even if economy opens what activities could be done without any further fear or whether or any further grief my company which is there which whether it is in a red hot spot area a green zone or a orange zone i am not aware one question which is troubling today is that what should be my transfer pricing policy for 2021 perspective because even if there is a lockdown which will open up my 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 transaction with my associated enterprise will start to them the answer is something like this there is no clear answer one will have to make some kind of guesswork whether you believe that because of this economic downturn in the industry which you are operating take a case if you are operating in a ppe kind of industry or a medical equipment industry your business has have flourished it has not really resulted in a economic downturn but if you are in an industry which may result in an economic downturn what is the percentage which i believe that overall industry would be impacted i reduce my margin for the inter company transaction which happens in 2021 thereafter i go further maybe in the month of december maybe if at all situation normalizes because if the threats are real that the vaccines would be in the month of july and january and december normalcy will never return one after one each people each industry would be caught by this medical war if such is the case one will have to see whether there can be a true up or true down which is taking place some people have in order to avoid litigation adopted for safe harbor rules this can be certain it companies who are doing certain its functions maybe 17% on a cost sounds reasonable i am i am a small tech payer i don't want to subject to any transfer pricing litigation so i may be fine paying a cost plus 17% options have to be exercised on a by by basis they will have to test whether i may be right giving a margin of 17% or the time is right to benchmark the transaction at 10 or 12% and still save tax to the extent of 5% concern people who have concluded aps will have to revisit whether my critical assumptions are getting impaired or are getting disturbed because of this particular change in businesses which we will see that's largely an end from myself in terms of various consequences i am abstaining not to go on to the tax implications which may follow because of india's accounting that may be a session in itself with this i end at this moment leaving open the floor for questions if any thank you bomik uh, we have one question in our chat box by sangeeta garg uh, where okay, she says i i am reading it and i am taking it now akshita yes uh, sangeeta says are the loan waivers still allowed under the tax as tax deductible provisions i am not clear on uh, the basis whether there is any provision uh, which supports so first of all who i am seeing as far as loan waiver is concerned if i have borrowed money then waiver will if at all give rise to certain profitability in a common sense term so one does not uh, can you remove the screen share okay somebody has objection with screen share maybe mm -hmm. uh okay but uh, what has happened is uh, okay uh, uh okay you may uh, ask the questions uh, but i don't know sangeeta if i am waiving off a loan how far it gives rise to uh, a gain and deduction deduction is to the person in our cases parent company etc which you were speaking which acts as a guarantor concern Ruthwick thereafter mentions that can there be certain dar consequences if I am selling off my sell uh, equity and thereafter I am purchasing off my equity. Uh, uh, I am fairly sure uh, uh, there can be a lot of debates on what I am speaking. Two things are there. There is an inbuilt safeguarding mechanisms which are there. What are the safeguarding mechanisms? Is that if my tax benefit does not exceed three crores, my three crore tax benefit means. that if i my tax benefit exceeds 3 crores in that case in that case you subject me to gar cuts now two two questions will arise is that if if i consider 20% as a taxable rate if at all that means i have to cross a economic loss of more than 15 crores concern one possible there may be catch and i who may be having more losses than this amount so for small players definitely gar may not be a concern one 
Number two, I may be genuinely doing a portfolio rigid. So if I was otherwise in a TCS kind of exposition, I may not buy some similar shares or maybe it may be a wait and watch concern where I may like to just rejig the portfolio in a manner that overall risk are kept as it is. It may not be a mirror one by one kind of stock purchase. I may just change the portfolio in a manner that overall attributes are achieved. It is equally possible that whenever a person invests and one looks at back, it could have been a case where I should have stated that rather than investing in a pharma company A, I should have invested in a pharma company B. Your portfolio continues when it comes to the exposure to a particular pharma industry. So this would be the way in which uh, I would uh, state it. Now, unfortunately, what has happened is that the chat box, yeah, I can see. So this was on GAR, uh, which was there. Uh, uh, yes, your main purpose has to be tax avoidance. Second, GAR has certain peculiar situations as to when, when I am seeing it. So for example, if I have taken shares and I'm selling it on a piece by piece basis. So for example, I am taking shares, say for example, Reliance, which have increased 20% since it's low or 25% since it's all time low right now. Then it is possible that I may be selling shares in a piecemeal time. So in year one, when I'm selling shares, my gain not, may not be more than three crores. So while overall, Portfolio which would have been sold would have a loss which may be more, which may be more, but I have to see GAR benefit on a year on year basis and therefore there can be a possibility concern where uh, I may be able to uh, put across the, uh, uh, this particular thing. Uh, moving further, moving further, just hold on, uh, just hold on, yeah. Uh, I, uh, if you can see, yeah, Ruthwick, you are unmute as also your video can be shared. If there are any questions, you can directly pose it on the window. No, thanks, Bomek. I think that was the whole idea. I think the idea was whether <clears throat> the GAR implications and especially as you said, you know, there would be cases of say sale of properties, there would be sale of securities. And there could be, as you mentioned correctly, there is a huge opportunity right now for many people who are willing to take that risk. And they are buying it back. So your point is valid. I think whether probably uh, some documentation may be needed to be kept to justify that, you know, there could be a fire sale. Uh, at the very start, that could be a fire sale just out of the uh, way the economy downturned globally. And therefore, when you are again feeling there is a bit of confidence in the economy, you may again buy back. Should that be considered under GAR? Maybe, you know, with proper documentation, if it might help out. But your and point again, is valid. I am not alone, Ruthwick, when I am selling it. The world yeah. has sold it. So to prove the tax authorities that the only main purpose was this, because don't forget with this, I'm also taking a risk of buying at this level. Nobody knows where we are sitting today, how future will be undone. Assuming, and this is just a short in dark. And as I say that all assumptions which I spoke today should be false. That, econ that one is not able to arrest COVID output or after the lockdown opens, there is again a need to bring down the lockdown because the case increases. You never Correct. know which way market is going. Mm -hmm. And hence for a tax authority to say that when you are investing today, you are sure, sure clear that it was it will give rise to an upside tomorrow it appears to be too far-fetched. I agree with you fully. Yes, yes. Uh, there is Sumit who is mentioning anything to address 53 CA valuations, time will test. DBO can be another case 56 to 10 says that if you don't agree with a particular immovable property valuations, go to a DBO. But here would be the cases where there may be certain stress sales even on real estate, which may happen. In that case, something which is at a ready reckoner value, take a case of Nariman point or, or BKC where the real where ready reckoner value is largely very, very close to fair market value. If the properties are sold at a lower price and if it may be a, just a stress sell on my part, then there can be a cause of 56 to 56 to 10. As I stated, these are the provisions which sees world with suspicion because they see world with suspicion. Even if I'm standing myself in front of mirror, the only answer is that I also need to look myself with suspicion. Uh, interest income, which has become bad and doubtful for FY 1920, can tax authorities bifurcate between a pre COVID and a post COVID era. Now what, uh, ICDS says is that you accrue interest on a time proportionate basis. Fair enough. 
but there are principles under the act and those two decisions and thereafter we go to those prajapati naidus and ed sasuns of the world which says that you an income can be charged when it accrues now when the accrual itself is questionable when my ability of the payer itself to give me the interest is questionable to my mind irrespective of the time period this amount may not be chargeable to tax it would be fine on my part if i offer it to tax when certain normalcy resumes uh, i think we reached the end of the session yes yes so thank you bombik for such a comprehensive presentation and lucidly taking us through all the various nuances of the direct tax provision arising due to the current pandemic thank you for your valuable time and i thank all the participants for joining today please stay home and stay safe thank you thank you end the meeting here